a little sensitivity to, for in the color color coding, and sometimes some of the pictures of the mountains. So, uh. so I was looking at one of these pictures in the studio, and I said, you know, that looks like white. For you've been looking at white, and he said, oh yes. Now, Wyatt's influence in China has always been seen as starting in 1979 with the Chandra realists. But he said he'd seen the first uh, catalogue of Wyatt, which had been brought back to China by a political leader in 1973 from America, when after Nixon's visit there was a whole bunch of senior leaders, as they called it in China, who went to America and took back Wyatt's catalogue. And he said, he was then an art student, but he was from the elite. His father was a high official or a PLA general, I don't know. Um, and this catalogue had been seen in the home of his friend, his school friend. And that, so in other words, a full six years before any other kind of work has been produced in the Chinese art world, which looks like a kind of wire, uh, tempera sort of overbrushed landscape or something, figure in the landscape. And that then appears in Chinese oil painting. For six years before that, younger artists have already been looking at the material. So these relationships to a putative Chinese past are often already transformed, long transformed, by access to other kinds of imagery, which they've seen five or six or seven years beforehand. But am I right to say, also, all these information flows comes in fits and starts because yes. of, you know, tumultuous Chinese history. You know, where, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom, right? And then they'll shut it down with anti-spiritual pollution campaigns. Um, and which means that, you know, um, information from the West and the outside comes in at quite different, at uh, varying speeds. And also, who gets what is sometimes determined by who you know. And if you happen to be close friends with, um, with a son uh, whose father is Padre, there's a higher chance that you will get all these information from these uh, Western magazines uh, that come through their hands and have to be vetted. So there's a kind of an underground um, dissemination of information between uh, these cadres and artists. Um, I've also heard about you know people, uh, artists having uh, foreign girlfriends, boyfriends, and. Personal relationships are actually quite important in disseminating art information from the outside. And there is, uh, of John mentions the important cadaver school in this chapter. Um, you want to see some cadaver school just to remind you yeah. how awful it is? Okay, here we go. I quite like some of these. <laughs> this is a real, a real hand from a real court. It's called, it was called in French originally. Theologie Portative, Portable Theology, or I don't know, I forget what the English is called. Well, there is, um, there is a sense that, you know, if one looks at this, um, that it looks like something from the YBAs, right? You know, um, but it is true that they did hear something about, you know, the sensation exhibition um, through a catalogue that uh, another Chinese artist brought back when he was away in Europe. Um, and through these in informal channels of information distribution, he, these groups of artists did get to know about what's happening. Uh, you might need a health warning for this picture. This is a, a putative uh, real fetus that was aborted and you know that he cooked and ate. This is a Chinese artist, Zhu Yu, uh, who was trained as a painter, and he still paints. Um, and the, the photograph is, it doesn't say it anyway, the photograph was probably taken by the professor of sculpture at the Central Academy of Fine Art. Done one. Um, but whilst the, you know, the, the pocket theology, if you look at the image, you might actually just think it's you know, part of that circulation of images with the contemporary, with contemporary art, global contemporary art. But, um, if you ask the Chinese critics, they will say that this relates very much to the moral vacuum that exists in China. And, you know, this sense of uh, pushing it to the point of, you know, kind of aesthetic brinksmanship, um, which then relates to that sense of uh, nihilistic existence um, that's currently what, you know, is 
been described in China. Um, if I may, just because yeah. you're on this as a topic, interject, um, John also points out that there's really no, no accurate on this, really no equivalent of this whatsoever in Thai, Thai modern art. This is one area in which you say there's absolutely no... It doesn't seem to be. It just, yeah, it doesn't seem to be And the sensationalism seems to be part of the Chinese positioning. For example, uh, very good pair of artists who, who also do the same sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know if it was part of what uh, was intended by the artist, but the image uh, of eating the, the baby, the cook's baby, circulated on the internet uh, in, with sort of a whole thing around uh, people basically putting parts of children's into grocery store products. I mean, there was a whole kind of thing, and that was one of these many images. Was that just an internet kind of a thing, or did the artist do that? or? Uh, well, uh, this is actually this is an actual work. Um, the problem with uh, Julie was eating babies is, as Thomas, uh, my colleague, interviewed him about it. I haven't. Was that he tended it tended to be almost clear he had, but it was left ambiguous about whether he'd actually eaten the baby or not. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm a little lost. I, I get that we're talking about certain contemporary Chinese art and where the influences came from. And then occasionally you, you sort of utter that nothing like this would ever happen in Thailand. So I'm not sure, are we? I think, so. What's Sorry, the, I think it, it, it's coming up, okay. the answer to that, that question. There is a sort of reaction. <laughs> Again, also, there is a sort yeah. of... Uh, yeah, there is, a, there is no well, question. Question. It's, it's, it's funny because as you say that, I was thinking this it's a moment good, good, good. Good. You didn't really address, um, in a sense, I skipped over this whole question why the comparative study between China okay. and Thailand exactly? Because they're unlike. And, yeah, uh, John was, he chose these, these um, two cultures for this kind of comparative study, hoping, it, it, well, I shouldn't say hoping, uh, wondering if in examining two very unlike cultures, you could see any similarities emerge from them. And as they do, well yes, and you can see some, and as they do emerge, you may begin possibly to say that that is where you see it, what we might call an Asian modernism, or a distinctly Asian or region, more regional you should, I don't want to mischaracterize, but no, no. Um, we kind of skipped over that, and I think that that's an essential the problem, the problem, issue by the comparative The study. problem with this work is it arises out of a whole series of studies about where is modernity, and what is modern art, because if you take the West, Western um, line from Courbet through Picasso to Jackson Pollock, none of this is modern. It's all a bad copy, or later, or an imitation. It's got nothing to do with the culture in which it's in place. It's an importation for us. The number of negative characteristics of this art from that kind of line, which is the October line, as manifested in the book Art in the 20th Century, which included 13 artists of Asian origin, all resident in Soho, <laughs> New York. For those of you who don't know. Uh, they, I mean, you know, the, the whole thing is impossible. Uh, if you wanted to find out what modernity was, then you could be, as I showed in uh, Modern Asian Art, which was published in 1998, basically comparing a number of Asian countries with one model, which is the Japanese historical model, which, by the way, even today, is still the most detailed model, has the most textual basis, or starting back in the middle of the 19th century, the uh, intellectual, uh, the documentary, physical residue, uh, collection, con contemporary recurrent analytical exhibition culture in Japan is unlike anywhere else in Asia. Bits of it exist here and there. Nothing exists on the same scale with the same systematicity. The Japanese example is a very important one because you can see things happening in Japan which happen elsewhere in Asia for different kinds of periodization but for the first time. And that was the book, Modern Asian Art. But I wanted to say, well, can we go out of this? And as it happened, I had a certain relation to Thailand. And I thought, let's, and I did a relationship to China. So I thought I'd see if I could do something between them. And it was entirely justified, in my, in my view, the whole effort was entirely justified, when I heard a Chinese art historian, a 
Chinese art historian said about this project, he said, oh, it's like trying to compare an elephant with an ant. <laughs> Guess who the ants are? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was entirely validated by that. I felt entirely justified uh, because I began to see so many phenomena which are not mapped by any of these Western models. And particularly if you take what apparently are unlike cultures and, and then start thinking about them together, you start asking yourself questions. For example, how many artists do you need to have in an art world in order to have one not? Is there a relationship? Is there a numerical feature about the art world? And China, which looks so large in modern art terms, certainly from the 1990s, dominating a market, images circulating everywhere, political connotations of art being widely discussed internationally, so on and so forth, begins to look like a pygmy compared to some other Asian countries if you go into per capita. There are four times as many per capita fine art graduates in Thailand as there are in China. Four times as many. And when you start looking at comparative, then you see that it, to some extent it, re it resembles educational developmental model. And by the way, my work research on China was done by a, Ch a Chinese art historian. We got access to figures I could never get, so they're reliable. The Taiwan's are easier because I got a Thai uh, doctor of PhD student in education to go and count the number of people who graduated from Thailand in fine art in one year. We begin to see that uh, the, a, a, a very usable statistic, which in fact I worked out myself 10 or 15 years ago on Taiwan, is the number of graduates in fine arts per annum in 100,000 of population. How many are there in China? 0.25. How many are there in Thailand? About the same as there are in Singapore and in Taiwan, about 1 to 1.5. How many are there in Japan? Four. How many are there in Australia? Between six and eight, depending on how you get the statistics. So you're beginning to see that these different types of structure begin to resemble one another and make them into comparable in a way which how much family Jun or um, uh, you've done the way we've to raise the particular figure got in their last auction. This is not a figure that's of any interest. In understanding modernity, it's an interest in, 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 in under, a figure which is of great significance in understanding a kind of relationship between a local art world and an international art world, or an international art world which thinks of itself as global, but it doesn't tell you what the structure of a particular art world is. Maybe I'd just like to alight on my final point, which is also a question to John. Uh, you, you have you created a special little section for female, female artists and oh, women's art. That was so, and in fact, um, you said that, it almost seems as if you, you set them apart, yeah. you know, practiced by female artists from the male-dominated academy or the male-dominated, you know, art scene. Uh, I just wonder if you might say a little bit more about the relationship of recognizing female practice and the importance of it to the articulations of modernity. China. Well, actually, no, if you sit around the courtyard in Silverborn, you see all the blokes talking to one another. The two relations, the two art worlds, the Chinese art world, the Chinese art world to some extent is better than the uh, Thai art world because uh, women have positions and move in uh, professional appointments in the Chinese art world a little bit more freely than they seem to do in Thailand, but that's only an anecdotal impression. I haven't done any statistics on it. Um, I just thought it would be useful to try and think around the year 1995, because that was the International Year of, of Women, about how many women artists or what kind of women artists became prominent in what way in China, and also to think at the same time, roughly speaking, in, in Thailand there were about six to eight art, women artists of some prominence in that year. Um, you, you do bring up in Thailand, um, he does bring up also women artists as a category. And, um, you do make the point that they emerge without a quote feminist agenda behind their work, uh, unlike in 
the West where we tend to see this emerging in the 70s and this is part of a larger. If anybody wants to seriously know why women artists in Asia avoided feminist theorism, read the article in Yishu, the Journal of Chinese Contemporary Art, by, uh, which was by, um, who's an anthropologist in Washington University? Um, there's a woman I had for works in Washington, uh, University of Washington, Seattle. Um, anyway, she did. your bibliography. Yes, and it's there. And she went to uh, China with Judy Chicago. And if you want to see full flown feminist theory patronism in, 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 in clear uh, discussion, you, you see what Judy Chicago told the women when she walked to the villages on the Long March about what women's role in art or what women's subject matter is and what. We don't need any further introduction. In other words, there's a sort of theoretical priority and a sort of intellectual patronage which is given by feminists. I'm not saying feminist ideas are wrong. Obviously, I'm not saying Just the, the manner of interaction between certain feminists, theoretically oriented, that art, women artists, and the artist populations that we're in touch with, and that's a very interesting tongue-in-cheek record of what Judy Chicago actually said. But, well, I'm playing the devil's advocate here, but presumably China is, you know, would be quite familiar with ideological indoctrination. After all, you know, they did have, you know, socialist ideology backing up their political apparatus. So, you know, why would they be so, you know, against such a, you know, I don't know, heavily theoretical edifice in terms of, you know, Western feminism. What exactly is the, you know, that um, core... Fe feminist theory came in after the um, women's year, International Year of the Women in 95. It's, it's a later development. Many of the texts only began to be translated in or discussed by artists who could read them, in, uh, or art, uh, art historians who could read them only began to be read towards the end of the 1990s in China. They appear in various parts of the press at that time. Um, and there are up to date, that's right, I can remember only three histories of art by women in China, by women in art history. So, it, it, it's just a way of thinking about round the back of what my modernity might be. Because it's usually yeah, self congratulatory you know. Well, what's that? Could you, for some of this who don't know, could you sort of paraphrase or summarize, encapsulate a significant paradigm of Asian modernism? Ah, uh, <laughs> reject. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. I keep talking about it, but I don't know what it is. Well, <laughs> there's three books on the subject. Um, Asian modernism. I mean, I don't think, I think one of the, the reasons that question stumps is because there isn't a single definition of Asian modernism. And what are we um, talking about? Well, <laughs> well, well <laughs> you know, I think that what we're trying to get at partly is this idea of how to understand how there is this phenomenon of Asian modernism, but um, we are constantly trying to define it against what, you know, what I bring from New York or or what we bring from Europe, or what I did my my doctoral studies in French and American modernism. So even I will come to it, even though I've been following Asian contemporary for you know almost two decades. We we tend to define it from that that Western model. Um, and I right. I, I mean, we what I get out that. Well, so you know. so how, how does the author read the book? <laughs> well, actually, we will we will get there. Um, <laughs> That's right. I, 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 yeah. About ten years of my life trying to do it. I'm going to summer in five minutes. Um, I don't know if I can. second. Um, maybe I'll follow what Adele was saying with just speaking a little bit about the second chapter where John talks about um, the situation in Thailand um, and eventually uh, follows that with a, with a comparison um, between China and um, Thailand. Um, he he speaks first about the background of the history. That, well, he basically says that in Thailand, the development of modern art in Thailand can never be separated entirely from uh, the econ economic and political uh, life of, of Thailand. Of, uh, of course, Siam originally, uh, and then Thailand after the late 1930s. Um, 
so he provides that background, a little bit of that uh, political background, so that we understand some of the context. Um, and then talks about how some very basic themes emerge from that, uh, from this. Um, yeah, sure. No, um, really, thank you. Gregory, just a second. Um, there are possibly some people that uh, guys who are not real familiar with all of the discussions we're going. If there is a translation, yes, it's going to be after an hour's talking. <laughs> so I just want to ask for anyone want any translation. If, if not, so it's going to be like let it flow. We can do some time summary, yeah. which we'd yeah. love to do if you want to. Yeah. That would be helpful. Uh, it's not just okay. Speak up. <laughs> like you, you can, you can be the uh, oh. spokesperson. <laughs> well, um, I, I'll continue simply by saying that um, there's several major themes of this chapter, which are all very uh, interesting in terms of uh, trying to draw some basic uh, uh, features out of the development of modern and contemporary Thai art. Um, essentially talking about the political and economic background, of course, which uh, John contends can never be separated from the discussion of Thai uh, modern art. Um, talking also about how um, after, uh, coming out of the, the uh, period of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the influence, of course, in the West in uh, Sinipagon, uh, through uh, Sinipirasi, and um, the idea that uh, a modern art from the West, so to speak, could be brought in and uh, assimilated and merged with a, some kind of Thai element in Sinigiris's confidence that that could be done in Thailand, and that, that in many ways was some kind of ideal to, to be achieved at some point in Thailand's history. Um, that, uh, that also characterizing the um, context for modern art in Thailand is already um, a strong tradition, a ceremonial tradition for imagery, of course, coming out of both the religious and um, uh, other uh, 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 sectors of society. And uh, with this very formal tradition, this modern Western, uh, I, in many ways I call it an importation, uh, being brought in through uh, uh, the, the influence of Simpiracy and then others. Um, he says essentially that modern uh, modernism, Western modernism, is actually favored in Thailand for several reasons. It, it gains uh, strength and influence, partly through, as I say, a Western teacher, a Sibiracy, Sibiracy system of, of absorbing this current from the West, um, four waves of artists uh, traveling overseas to study between the 1950s and the 1990s. Um, uh, uh, foreign exhibitions, artists beginning to participate and look to the West uh, for venues in which to participate. And uh, they're brought into biennials and art fairs and, and whatnot, especially in the 1990s forward. Um, and uh, then this issue of tiness what, that is always being dealt with, how do you bring a Thai element into uh, an assimilated Western uh, modern uh, idiom. Uh, whether, whatever style you happen to be practicing, say if you're a painter or a sculptor traditionally nowadays, of course it goes into all other media. Um, so um, he, he also speaks about how unlike China, there's no direct censoring of art really in Thailand. There's more of a soft a sensory in the way that people obviously are you know, were raised in a certain culture with certain values and there are certain things that aren't perhaps engaged because um, of conditioning or the educational system but there's no overt censoring I guess uh, you would say in the sense that China well that does might, censorship does exist well, of course in China, and, and books get destroyed yeah. this one for mm -hmm. example uh, and with highly political content and so forth at a particular time. Um, but um, there isn't, a, on, apart from uh, situations to do with uh, national symbols of, or royal symbols in Thailand which are subject to particular legal uh, restriction, um, there's no organization of censorship. <laughs> specific censorship organization which you get through the propaganda ministry uh, in, in 
in China. And that, don't forget that the propaganda ministry, or what is now called the Public Relations Department, which is actually, a, it's actually a, a government ministry under the Communist Party, um, has departmental levels at all, uh, if you like, hierarchies in Chinese society, which control whether a certain kind of expression should be allowed or not. And particularly the artwork, which may be of interest to people, is that when works are submitted, or in the past were submitted, increasingly artists just ignore the system of national fine arts exhibitions, or regional, provincial artists exhibitions. But when works are submitted for exhibition at, say, a provincial exhibition of the, uh, the, of the Provincial Chinese Artists Association, they are subject to review by the organization which submits them, right? that, that is to say, the art school which submits them. So the responsibility for a work being, inter uh, being compatible with national standards, as we might call them, or party standards as we also want to call them, is to do with the work unit. It is not the artist himself. Um, of course, the artist engages the prior self-censorship before submission. But it, the unit itself is responsible, the work unit is responsible for that kind of control. So there is, if you like, an in-house kind of control, um, which doesn't, as far as I know, exist in Thailand. They may have done it at some point. Um, there, are there many work units then? Like different well, the, the problem is complicated, or made much more interesting, by the fact that after 1979, artists could form their own unit in the past, the unit, for example, the art school, the illustration department of a newspaper, the um, places that artists were typically allocated to work out would have been museums and, and education parks and museums and so forth. Um, they would be responsible for controlling the output of the artist. The artist would be allowed to work in their studio, which was part of their work allocation, resources and so forth. That, their actual salary came in the form of uh, food coupons from their, their unit or all kinds of discounted food availability from their units, more actively food. But after 1979, artists were allowed to form their own unit, that's to say to constitute an individual unit, which, would, which, which was then able to function like an individual with their own limited set of economic and so the activity rights. You couldn't, I mean, even during this process, you couldn't actually sit at home and just produce art, you have to be a part of it. Technically from 1979, uh, I'm not quite sure when um, the unit, the ability of units was, act, was actually dated to, but practically it was already there in 1981. Um, of course, it, the advantage of being in a unit was you would get all kinds of social security, pension, cheap housing, um, food access to food rights, so that went on right up until the end of the 1980s. But after that, artists, if they wanted to make money, they wouldn't do it through their unit. But, but previously, were they allowed to make art without being in a unit? Could they no. actually... No, they couldn't exhibit art without like, There's two things you have to remember in China. One is making art, and the other is exhibiting it. And some kinds of art couldn't be made at all, because they're regarded as anti-party or bourgeois formalist in some a particular period. For example, abstract or impressionist painting was frowned on from very specifically 1959 when there was an anti-impressionism movement run by the party. However, from around 1979 and certainly by the early 1980s, artists could paint in any way they wanted to, but they couldn't necessarily submit that work to national painting, painting exhibitions or exhibit it in a teacher's exhibition. They could do it in their studio. Just trying to get an idea of the, of the context then. So could they sell it to someone more? They could sell it personally, yes. Okay, but it just couldn't be exhibited in one of these Yes, places. right. And the, but then the Chinese gallery system really started in the 1990s. Before that, the uh, gallery exhibition was largely to shops belong, belonging to the Artists Association. And please don't forget that all the every time you see a Chinese set, uh, statement about Chinese art which says such and such an artist group, exhibited such and such an exhibition. Please remember that it is not a social group with a social identity. Artists are not allowed to, even today, not allowed to form groups in China with a continuous